Welcome to Volume 2 of Flying Saucers Are Real. We'll present information on the famous Betty and Barney Hill abduction case, the star map work that tells us where those particular alien visitors originated, supposed autopsy of an alien being recovered in New Mexico, the Operation Majestic 12, MJ-12 magic papers, which I think are the most important documents ever leaked to the American public. Join us. There is no way in the world I can tell you everything you always wanted to know about flying saucers in one program, or even five. What I can do is sort of take you by the hand and lead you past the evidence that has led me to the conclusions that I've reached after 35 years of study. The evidence is simply overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. Some UFOs are alien spacecraft. It came from this direction over here, which is for the Holiday Inn, and it just came straight up and then moved directly over us, and then out over across the bay and took a right-hand turn and went in a northeast direction, and then blinked out. The subject of flying saucers represents a kind of cosmic water gate. That is to say, some few people in the governments of the United States, Canada, undoubtedly many other countries that have known since July 1947 when two crash flying saucers and their crews were recovered in New Mexico that some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. Area 51, that mysterious corner of the Nevada test site, is no longer much of a secret. The fact that secretive things go on here is a given, even to the Soviets, who make daily spy flights over the facility to take a peek at what's going on. It's the perfect place for secret things, but of course, that's no secret. 51 is ringed by the forbidden vastness of the Nevada test site, by the looming Groom Mountains, and by sparsely populated desert expanses. The few people who do live out here have no love lost for the military, but they're conservative, patriotic, and they mind their own business. You ever see stuff you can't explain? Sure. Lots of stuff. Care to elaborate? No. UFOs. Is there a government conspiracy to keep the truth from America? Tonight on the UFO Conspiracy, a team of investigators uncovers provocative new evidence. We're dealing with the cosmic Watergate. Thursday, October 11, 1973, around dusk. Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker were fishing at this side on the Pascagoula River when they say a strange craft emitting a bluish light came down and hovered just above the ground 30 feet away. Now living and working in Golden Meadow, Louisiana, with its family, Calvin believes the U.S. government has knowledge of extraterrestrial life that it is hiding from the public. I think the government more or less knows about them, but they're just scared to get it out in the public. Do you think the United States government is keeping something from us about UFOs? There's no doubt in my mind that they, they are. Man is not alone in the universe. He's not alone in the neighborhood. Our future as Earthlings is tied in with space. The time to start thinking in those terms is now.
There are three different categories of UFO sighting reports. First, the IFOs, that is UFO sightings converted into identifiable flying objects. People have seen all kinds of things, and most sightings can be explained. Having said that, let's forget Category 1 sightings. Category 2 sightings must also be dismissed. These are the reports for which there is insufficient information on which to base any kind of scientific judgment as to what was observed. If you don't have enough data, forget it. There's no point in wasting your time on those sightings. Finally, that leaves us only with the sightings in Category 3. These are the reports by competent observers of strange phenomena in the sky or on the ground, which the observer cannot identify, which remain unidentified after investigation by competent investigators, and which furthermore we judge to be manufactured objects based on the way they look, not just lights in the sky, and we deduce they were made someplace else based on the way they were observed to behave. Hey. This home videotape was recorded during one of the trips to the Groom Mountains. Okay. Good luck. No way. Did you see that move it did? No, I didn't. It, it was like I kept doing... Oh, oh no, Brian, it's getting... Look at it now. Right. Here, hold on, right here. Are you, are you there? No. Right, right now. A major point I'd like to make in this program is that every large-scale scientific study of flying saucers has provided us with a substantial number of Category 3 reports. Competent observer, competent investigator, plenty of data, and every indication we're dealing with intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. This is one of three videotapes of a bright light in the sky is over Gulf Breeze. This is another. People have flocked to the south end of the Bay Bridge in the past few weeks in droves over recent reports. What brought you out here in the first place? Curiosity. I'm a skeptic and I don't believe in flying to us, so I had to come to see for myself. Well, what do you think now after what you saw? Well, I'm still not convinced it's a flying saucer, but it's not a plane and it's not a helicopter, so whatever it is, I still haven't made up my mind. Now, the largest study ever done, official, comprehensive, government-sponsored study of flying saucers, was completed, believe it or not, way back in 1955. The study was done by the Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio, a very well-respected research and development firm. That was Battelle's job to go through 3,200 sightings from the Blue Book files for the period 1947 through 1952, and a very few thereafter. Every sighting report was eventually categorized as something or other. Aircraft, balloon, astronomical, miscellaneous. Uh, the insufficient information category, and of course the unknowns. Every sighting was evaluated as to quality. Subjective evaluation, but a useful one. They put all this data together in a big fat report, Project Blue Book, Special Report Number 14. Now, unfortunately, the report itself has never been publicly distributed by the Air Force. Instead, what was given wide distribution was a three-part package. A press release from which I'll quote in a minute. <laughs> And the thrust of this package was... Look, we just finished this huge study of flying saucers. There's nothing to them. But soon we will be building things that look like saucers. And if you see one, don't worry about it. It's ours. That's what the public was told. The United States Air Force, in discharging its responsibility for the aerospace defense of the nation, is called upon to investigate reports of unidentified flying objects. Two Air Force officers have over the years been very closely associated with this activity. Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Stacker was formerly the chief spokesman 
for the Air Force on the matter. And Major Hector Quintanella is now the chief of Project Blue Book. Major Quintanella, what are the objectives of Project Blue Book? The objectives of the program are twofold. They're the same as they have been since 1953 when the regulation was written. First of all, to try to determine if the UFO phenomena presents a threat to the security of the United States. And second, to determine if the UFO phenomena exhibits any technological advances which could be channeled into research and development. There is nothing to hide. There is nothing to hide at all. This is a copy of the privately published version of Project Blue Book Special Report 14. It is kind of interesting that the press release didn't mention the title of the report, because surely some reporter would have said, what happened to 1 through 13? They were all classified at that time, and the Air Force certainly wasn't talking about that. Now, in the press release, the Secretary of the Air Force, mind you, Donald Quarles, said, quote, on the basis of this report, we believe that no objects, such as those properly described as flying saucers, have overflown the United States. Even the unknown 3% could have been identified as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been available." Unquote. Well, let's look at the categorization of the 3,201 sightings. You'll notice that there are several different categories, uh, psychological aberrations, that's a nice way of saying crackpot cases. But the ones we're interested in are the unknowns. And you'll notice that the percentage of unknowns wasn't 3%, it wasn't 6%, it wasn't 12%, it was 21.5%. Seven times greater than the public was told by the Secretary of the Air Force. I suppose if one were generous, one might say that he wasn't very good at arithmetic. Now, the skeptic at this point might say, hey, wait a minute now, you said earlier that they did a quality evaluation of all those sightings. How do we know that those unknowns aren't just those two-second observations at four in the morning by the town drunk of the world. Perfectly legitimate question. Let's look at the quality evaluation of those same 3,201 sightings. The better the quality of the sighting, because of the background of the observer, the duration of observation, the circumstances, the more likely to be listed as an unknown. Exactly what you'd expect if the unknowns were really something different. Say hello now to Derek from Norfolk. Hello, Derek. Hello, Derek. Hello. What do you believe in? Well, I believe in the UFOs. Do you? Um, mm. I have seen a UFO, actually. I live have in you? Norfolk. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to be a security guard, so I used to wander around quite a bit at night time. Yes. And remember, at this point, we're dealing strictly with unknowns. Forget all the things that turned out to be Jupiter and Venus and searchlights on clouds and flocks and birds. I mean, the list is long as my arm. First, what did they look like? Well, typically we're dealing with, with the unknown, with apparently round, symmetric, seemingly metallic, disc-shaped objects, definite size, shape, surface texture, uh, texture, things sticking out that might be landing gear, might be antenna, might be decorations. We don't know. Those are interpretations. Typically, but not always, bigger in diameter than thickness, sometimes with a kind of dome, size ranging from, say, 10 feet in diameter up to perhaps 150 feet in diameter. That was the biggest category of unknowns, but there were also some very exciting reports of large cigar-shaped so-called motherships into and out of which the little disks fly. Now, with just a physical description of these unknowns, the round ones, the huge mother-shaped objects, the huge cigar-shaped mother vehicles, we have no base at all for saying these things come from off the Earth. Why not? Well, because there are at least 50 different companies down here on the surface of this planet that could build things that looked as I described. They built a lot of the stuff that's here at the Space Center. You know, Lockheed, NASA, Rockwell International, uh, under contract to NASA, Boeing, and a bunch of other companies. It's only when we add into the picture the behavior of these unknowns that we're suddenly forced to concede that we're dealing with something of extraterrestrial origin because these round, metallic, disc-shaped objects were able to sit still in the sky, hover, move straight up, straight down, move forward and then back without turning around, move at extremely high speeds horizontally, say 8,000 miles an hour as observed on radar, make almost right angle turns at high speeds like 2,200 miles an hour. All this rather unusual flight behavior typically 
without any visible external lines, without any wings, without any tail, without any noise. Area 51, that mysterious corner of the Nevada test site, is no longer much of a secret. The fact that secretive things go on here is a given, even to the Soviets, who make daily spy flights over the facility to take a peek at what's going on. A man who once worked at Groom Lake as a technician wrote this letter explaining how he inadvertently walked into the wrong hangar and saw what appeared to be a large metallic disc under a tarp. And an airman who worked at Nellis at a radar installation says he and his fellow servicemen watched over a period of five nights unusual objects flying over the Groom Mountains. He says the radar images indicate the object zoomed into range at speeds of 7,000 miles per hour and then would stop on a dime, and that nothing we have is capable of doing that. The airman says that when word of his sighting got out, he was ordered to turn off his radar sensors for that area and told to keep quiet about the matter because it did not happen. And I submit to you that back in the early 50s, there was no company on the surface of this planet that could, in quantity, because people often reported seeing whole flocks of these things, that could, in quantity, build things that both looked as I described and acted as I described. Because if they could, we Earthlings would no longer be building F-16s, 17s, 18s, MiG-29s, Mirage 5. The single most important thing about a flying saucer, from any government's viewpoint, is the potential for utilization of the technology for military purposes. Major Gordon, what are the objectives of Project Blue Book? First of all, to try to determine if the UFO phenomena presents a threat to the security of the United States. And second, to determine if the UFO phenomena exhibits any technological advances which could be channeled into research and development. Since we are still building F-16, 17, 18s, make 29s, Mirage 5, then what people saw back then wasn't built here on Earth. And if it wasn't built here, it was built someplace else. Now, where do I think they're from? Well, I'll name specific star systems a little bit later, but just down the street in our local neighborhood. That's a concept I try to get people to understand. Within 54 light years of here, in all directions around us, there are about a thousand stars. Of those thousand stars, 46 are similar to the sun. Not too hot, not too cold, not too old, not too new, a lot of other similarities. And might be expected to have planets in life. That's our focus, our local neighborhood. Joining me now are eminent scientist and believer in extraterrestrial intelligence, Stanton Friedman. Stanton, if I can start with you, you are a, a nuclear physicist. You have your feet very firmly on the ground as a scientist, yet you believe in UFOs. How well, does this come about? It, it's very easy since two-thirds of the people who express an opinion about flying saucers say they're real, and the greater the education, the more likely to believe they're real. It would be surprising if I didn't. It comes because I've spent 38 years collecting evidence, reviewing data. I've lectured at 600 colleges, I get lots of feedback, I've published 70 papers, that gives you more feedback. I do a lot of investigation. It's unlikely that anyone who's ever seen these photos will forget them. Odd shapes in the sky, accounts of laser-like blue beams, descriptions of alien creatures, and close encounters over the road. And even though I had the photos right there in front of me, and he was telling me all this, it was still hard to accept because things like that just don't happen, A, in Gulf Breeze, and B, to us. Burbank Tower, this is American Flight 812. Over. That's nothing from this world. You suppose the passengers saw it? I doubt it. Most of them are asleep. But it was quite a jolt, Jeff. I'll check. Good. We'll get a medical landing. Keep it quiet until we get instructions. Right. Okay, Denny. 
We normally think of courage in space flight in terms of how brave anybody was to get in the top of this rocket with all that propellant sitting below you, or any of those others crammed. Who knows what's going to happen? Our jet jockeys who take their chances in very sophisticated, unforgiving equipment. There's a different kind of courage that's required. That's the courage to fight for your ideas. What we find is that every step along the way, the guys with the new ideas were being hit on by the guys who say it can't be done. Not by guys who knew what they were talking about, but people who, for whatever reason, wanted to guard the status quo. Vehicle rolling from tail south around 235 degree azimuth. Something about your flight? Well, did you record it? Yeah. I radioed in immediately and they said we'll keep it quiet until you land. And as soon as we landed, Big Army Brass grabbed us and made us swear to secrecy about the whole thing. If there's anybody out there that got started just a, a little, little bit before, before we did on his or her technological kick, what do they know that we don't know? And how much time head start could they have? There are stars out there that are five billion years older than the sun. That's billion. Surely we could give them a million years head start on us. We've only been around a million years or so, something like man. The solar system is four and a half, five billion years old. So surely somebody out there could have a million years head start. Within 54 light years of here, in all directions around us, there are about a thousand stars. Of those thousand stars, 46 are similar to the sun. Not too hot, not too cold, not too old, not too new, a lot of other similar. And might be expected to have planets in one. That's our focus, our local neighborhood. abductions of humans by aliens have been around since the early 1960s. Betty and Barney Hill, a middle-aged New Hampshire couple, were reportedly snatched up by aliens in a flying saucer and eventually had their memories blocked. Since their case was made public, thousands of others alleged abductions have been reported all over the world. This is Betty and Barney Hill. It's a very famous case. It took place in 1961. There's a whole book, The Interrupted Journey, television movie, The UFO Incident, starring uh, James Earl Jones. It was September 19th, 1961. Betty and Barney were driving home to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is on the coast between Portland, Maine, and Boston, from Montreal. Driving through the White Mountains, late at night, nobody around. Betty spots a strange object. Barney was driving. She's looking out her side. A light in the sky, moving following the contour of the mountains. And she watched it for a while. She wasn't going to say anything. Suddenly, we began to see a strange light in the sky, which was maneuvering in a very erratic pattern. This light began flying along beside us and did this for about 30 miles until we came to an area known as Indian Head. We took the binoculars, they're bird watchers, took the binoculars out of the glove compartment, looked over at it. And it was strange, and it was moving in a strange fashion. Finally, she worked up enough courage to tell Barney. It's late at night now, after midnight. Barney, uh, there's a flying saucer out there. Oh, Betty, there are no flying saucers. It must be an airplane. He looks probably a Piper Cub. Don't worry about it. You know what a Piper Cub's doing up there at 1 in the morning? I don't know. But she says, Barney, it can't be. Look at it. Look how it's moving. Look at the lights. Oh. Oh, maybe you're right, Betty. It must be a helicopter. A helicopter. There are no flying saucers. And they talk quietly as they're heading south in the valley. This is following the hills. And suddenly it moves out across the road. And at that place, this light left the top of the mountain, came out over the highway, and stopped in mid-air directly in front of us. Barney jams on the brakes, gets out of the car, he's bound and determined, he's going to prove to Betty there's nothing strange about that strange thing out there. In the first place, it's sitting still, it's just hovering. Less than 
200 yards away, he estimates, 60 to 80 feet in diameter, just sitting there and no sound. Sitting there. No visible external engines, no wings, no tail, no blinking red and green lights. He cranks up the binoculars. There's a double row of windows there. He's moved out away from the, the vehicle ve now. Suddenly, he gets scared because on the other side of the windows, looking back at him, are some strange-looking beings. He panicked and he ran back to the car saying they planned to capture us. We had to get out of there. And we went speeding down the highway. He burns rubber. He's getting out of there. And at that point, we heard beeping sounds and the car vibrated. They see a sign that says Concord, New Hampshire. 17 miles. Should have been 50 miles. There's a lot of other strange little details that you have to read the book, The Interrupted Journey by John Fuller, to get. Now, when we arrived home, we had many puzzles. Tops of body shoes were scuffed. Our watches had stopped functioning. There were highly polished spots in the trunk of the car. Anyway, they report to the police that next day who say, call Pease Air Force Base, which is just outside Portsmouth. They report it there. They hear about NICAP, a group that investigates UFOs. So a month later, a NICAP investigator comes out and gets their whole story. But he has them go over the story systematically. What time did you leave Montreal? How fast were you driving? How much time for coffee and gas? And what time did you get home? When they do it this way, it becomes painfully obvious that they got home at least two hours later than they should have gotten home. It's only 192 miles. But the biggest mystery of all was the fact that it had taken us seven hours to drive 190 miles it suggested then that they see a hypnotist to find out what happened during the missing time interval. Well, they were both busy people. Betty, a social worker, super, supervising the welfare department, stayed in New Hampshire. Barney, uh, working in the post office down in Boston, but on the Governor's Civil Rights Commission. Betty checks with a colleague. As a social worker, she knew lots of psychologists. You know, we seem to have this missing time. Don't worry about it. Your memory will come back. Just wait a while. So they waited and waited and waited and waited and Betty had nightmares about strange beings kidnapping them. Barney developed an ulcer that got so bad he couldn't go to work. By now two years have gone by and they've got to do something. They've got to get Barney back to work. Betty gets a referral, or Barney gets a referral from a psychologist to a psychiatrist, Dr. Benjamin Simon, down in Boston. And the idea was to take care of two problems at once, find out what happened during the missing time, and get rid of the ulcer so I could get back to work. Okay, every Saturday, Saturday morning they drive the 60 miles to Boston. Betty waits outside. Marty goes in. Dr. Simon hypnotizes him, has him relive, not retell, but relive with all the emotions a portion of the experience. I can't, I, I can't do it anymore. <sighs> he tapes it. Induces amnesia at the end of the session, so Barney won't remember what he said, can't talk to Betty about it. Calms him down. Some of these are pretty powerful sessions. Sends Barney out, brings Betty in, does the same thing with her. This goes on every week for three and a half months, neither one of them knowing what's going on in the sessions, except that there must be something good happening because Barney's ulcer is taken care of. He's able to get back to work. Finally, Dr. Simon figures they're ready. He brings them both in together instead of separately and plays back a composite tape of all these sessions. I've heard the tape. They were astonished to find that they had each independently relived the same incredible experience. The beings that had been on the craft now standing in the middle of the road, a dirt road blocking our way. The car motor stalled. They separated, came up onto each side, took us out of the car, and at that point, I realized that they undoubtedly planned to take us on board. Of that craft having landed, of them being taken on board against their will, treated as specimens. Stick a needle here, scrape a little skin there. I was taken into the first room, Barney into the second room where we were given uh, as the leader, as I call him, gave us testing. No religious messages, no trip anywhere. Our examinations were very much similar in that 
with both Barney and I, they checked her eyes, ears, nose, throat, took samples of her hair, fingernail, and they scraped her skin. They were put back out, told they wouldn't remember, and didn't until this elaborate, sophisticated, expensive procedure was conducted. Now, let's face it, that's a pretty far out story. Well, I read the book, The Interrupted Journey. I read the Two Look magazine articles. I talked to John Fuller, talked to Dr. Simon. It was in my gray basket. Not black, not white, maybe. Everybody needs a gray basket about UFOs. And then I had the lucky opportunity in November 1968 to spend four hours with Betty and Barney, just the three of us, in Pittsburgh where I was living. I was very impressed with them. Obviously sensible, sensitive, intelligent people. To make a long story short, I buy the story. And you say, big deal, you believe them, where's the evidence? There's a lot of different kinds of evidence. I only want to focus on one part of it as appropriate for being here at the Space Center. Betty, under hypnosis, is reliving how she's trying to get the leader of this 11-being crew to tell her where he's from. And the understatement of the decade... I said, I know you're not from this planet. Now, Barney was in another room. They were being examined separately. So finally, to get her off his back, this leader shows her what I can only describe as a three-dimensional star map. It was like a, uh, an aquarium with points of light, which were supposedly stars, three feet by two feet by two feet, three different kinds of lines connecting these stars for trade expeditions and occasional expeditions and regular heavy trade, two big circles that were supposedly uh, the base stars connected by lots of lines. And she's looking up at this thing. And she asks the leader, well, where are you on the map? Wise guy alien, he says, you know where you are on the map? I told him, no, that I knew nothing about astronomy. How can I tell you where you're from, if, uh, where I'm from, if you don't know where you're at? I just didn't have the necessary knowledge. Now, poor Dr. Simon, the psychiatrist, world-class expert on post-traumatic stress syndrome using hypnosis to unlock what happened, I mean, it's bad enough he's got two intelligent people here telling this crazy story about a saucer landing being taking him on board. But now he's got a star map and trade routes, oh boy. He gives... Asks if Betty can remember what the map looked like. She says, yes. He gives her a post-hypnotic suggestion. If and only if she can remember it accurately, please draw it later on. She goes home and she draws, and you can see it here. This is what was published in the book. And it's kind of fascinating trade routes and occasional expeditions, but there is one little teeny tiny problem. What does it mean? We have no reference point. It's obviously not all the stars in the galaxy. It's not all the stars in the neighborhood. We'll never know is what people thought. Maybe it means something, maybe it doesn't, but there's no way to find out. Well, a brilliant woman named Marjorie Fish had read the book she was curious. She didn't think the aliens would look anything like us, and they seemed to be sort of humanoid. But she visited Betty and decided, well, there was one thing she could do. She could build a three-dimensional model of our local galactic neighborhood and see if she could find a three-dimensional pattern that matched the two-dimensional one that Betty drew. Well, it turned out she's now built a total of 26 three-dimensional models. Uh, the point of doing this now is that the stars are where they are. They're not randomly distributed. Uh, if we build a model, we can look around it from all different directions. What's difficult about doing this is we have great angle data on the stars. We know where to aim a telescope to see a particular star. Two angles tell us. But we don't have good distance data. Astronomers aren't going anywhere. It doesn't much matter how far or how close along this line of sight. But you can't build a model without the distance data. Now, Marjorie thought she'd get many fits to the map. She got none until she built a new model using, using the newest data, the Gliese catalog, Wilhelm Gliese, catalog of nearby stars, had the best data ever compiled on the distances. She rebuilt the model, and lo and behold, there was the pattern, angle for angle, line length for line length, what Betty had drawn. It's a special day for Marjorie, believe me. Now, here's a, one of her models that matches the star map. Now, there's several special things here you have to understand. First is a local neighborhood. 
the, the biggest model only went out 50 light years or so, so right next door. Second, all the stars connected with the lines are the right kind for planets and life, sun-like stars. And all the sun-like stars in this very well-defined three-dimensional volume of space are in the pattern. Now, the chance of that happening by accident, remembering that only 46 out of the 1,000 stars in the local neighborhood are like the sun, and yet every one of the pattern stars is a sun-like star, and every sun-like star in this volume of space is part of the pattern. The chance of that happening by accident, one in 10,000 to one in a million, depending on whose statistics you believe. Several special things now. One, the pattern makes sense near a star, near a star, near a star. That's good, not back and forth. Two, uh, strangely enough, it turns out that all the pattern stars are in a plane. It's like pepperoni on a pizza pan. Thin pizza, all in a plane. Rather than raisins in a big fat loaf of rice, raisin bread, which is what you'd expect that they'd be distributed all over the place. Nobody knew that before Marjorie's work. Most important, nobody doing what Marjorie we did before Betty had the experience in 61 or the book came out in 65 could have come up with the same identification of the stars because the correct distance data wasn't available until 1969. Obvious question. Where did Betty, a social worker, knew nothing about astronomy, get the right information as to where the stars were in 1961, when nobody on this planet had that information at that time? The only possible explanation is that it came from somebody from off the Earth. We can see that the source of that information had to be somebody who'd been away from the solar system. None of us Earthlings have been so far as we know. Even more intriguing, I suppose, is the fact that this work tells us where those particular aliens originated. Here's a map that shows the names of the stars in our very local neighborhood. Our star is the sun up in the top right-hand portion of the picture. Now, we're out in the boondocks here. Uh, the sun is four and a half light years from the next star over. There's not many stars behind us for 15 or 20 light years. We're out in the boondocks. The base stars, however, are 37 light years or so away from us. Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli. That's the Greek letter Zeta and the constellation reticulum. You can't see it from here. You've got to go down the equator or below. These two stars, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticulum, are only a few light weeks apart. They're a hundred times closer to each other than our star, the sun, is to the next star over. A hundred times. So from a planet around one, looking over at the other, you can see the other star all day long, and with a not very big telescope, you can directly observe, observe planets around the other star. Now, it wouldn't be surprising if there were earlier interstellar between the stars traveling, when your nearest neighbor is only a few light weeks away as it is for them, as opposed to our situation several light years. Especially when I tell you one of the key features about this star, these two stars, is that they're about a billion years older than the sun. Billion with the B. Just, just quickly, yes or no, do you believe in extraterrestrial life conceptually? The well, probability or at least possibility? There are 24 of us that left the Earth and came back. You know, there are 12 of us that walked on the moon. Uh, but how about things with, you know, like green and... Somebody originated you know. someplace else. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Just uh, Why not? Well, okay, why not? That's a good enough answer. All right. But we don't know. No. So again, would it be surprising to any rational person that beings with another sun-like star just around the corner would get started sooner on interstellar travel when they've got a billion-year opportunity for a head start? Very exciting piece of work.
I received a copy of the radar report from Peace Air Force Base, where they had tracked an unidentified craft at 2.14 a.m. in the morning, about the time, just about the time we estimate that the UFO left. We went back and we found the spot where we were captured. It was not a fantasy. It was a real experience. And I believe that I have enough evidence to establish that. His question, of course, is what do those guys look like? This is a drawing done by New Hampshire artist David Baker sitting next to Barney as Barney under hypnosis described what they look like. It's not an artist concept. It's a police artist drawing of a kidnapper if you want to look at it that way. Here is a sculpture done from a bunch of drawings like the ones you just saw. Your typical little gray man or typical Zeta reticulin, whatever you want to call him. Two arms, two legs, a head and a body, skull, skull bigger in proportion to the body than ours. Big eyes, practically no nose, mouth, ears. Uh, typical alien. Not a cross between a giraffe and a zebra. The science fiction writers are much more imaginative than, than the abduction witnesses. Remember now, this is one of hundreds of cases that have been carefully investigated of abductions. It's happening. Whether we like it or not is beside the point. The evidence suggests, beyond any doubt, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, we're being visited by some kind of, some form of intelligence which is higher than ours, and some kind of technology which is higher than ours, and it is able to pick up human beings at will uh, as objects of study, the way we might uh, a lesser species. To admit all of those things as possibility, um, as a real possibility, is to be staggered. So we keep it at arm's length conveniently. Uh, the evidence is simply overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited. Now, you've got to ask the right question. I'm certainly not saying all UFOs are alien spacecraft, mm -hmm. any more than all isotopes are fissionable. So you're not except that lots of UFOs are, in fact, imaginary, and people sort of... M most isotopes aren't fissionable either. Most people aren't seven feet tall, but the basketball coach says, give me the guy who is. I don't care about the midgets for the world. Okay. Yeah, that's what's set it up. You're a very successful builder, contractor in, in Gulf Breeze, making good money, and one night on Nove in November of 87, right. you see an object. Right. Um, I had no inclination as to what that day might bring. It was Veterans Day, 1987. I'd come home and was wrapping up my business uh, for that day, sitting in my office, looked out the glass uh, picture window over my uh, desk in my office, and a a light caught my eye through the pine burrows of some trees out in my circle driveway, and lo and behold, I couldn't figure, what is this thing? Is a glow there? What is this? And it was obscured by the, by the trees. So I was curious enough, so I got up with my front porch, got a little bit clearer look at it, and just the adrenaline starts flowing because you realize immediately you're not looking at something of our technology, or our technology that you think that we might possess. Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker, two Mississippi fishermen, reportedly abducted and examined by creatures aboard a UFO in Pascagoula in 1973. A doorway appeared and three creatures floated toward them. They just seemed to glide outside and one right behind the other and there was three of them. Area 51, that mysterious corner of the Nevada test site, is no longer much of a secret. We have communicated with several people who say they know of the saucer program. A technician in a highly sensitive position told us it is, quote, common knowledge among those with high security clearances that recovered alien disks are stored at the Nevada test site. A Las Vegas professional who once served in the military and was stationed at the test site says he saw a flying disc land outside the boundaries of Area 51. The best paper by far, in my opinion, was one by the late Dr. James E. McDonald. Jim was a professor of physics at the University of Arizona and initially a skeptic about flying saucers. I was still until I believed the evidence. Jim personally interviewed over 500 witnesses. 
And these are almost all pre-screened cases. So we spend his time on the unknowns rather than the knowns, which is the way to do it. If to make a long story short, he concluded that this is the most challenging scientific problem of our time, that some UFOs are of extraterrestrial origin, and that the Air Force Project Blue Book effort, at least, was completely inadequate from a scientific viewpoint. But he went a step, a step farther. He presented information on 41 separate cases, subdivided into six groups, each group dealing with the typical objection of the debunker. You've probably heard them all. How come they're never seen on radar? Here's half a dozen good radar cases. And an airman who worked at Nellis at a radar installation says he and his fellow servicemen watched over a period of five nights unusual objects flying over the Groom Mountains. He says the radar images indicate the object zoomed into range at speeds of 7,000 miles per hour and then would stop on a dime. And that nothing we have is capable of doing that. Why aren't they ever seen over big cities? Give you a bunch of big city cases. Multiple witnesses. Ten witnesses. Twenty witnesses. Fifty witnesses. Well, how come they're never seen by the professionals who watch the sky? The meteorologists, the astronomers, the pilots. He gives you a bunch of sightings by each of those groups as well. You can raise any of those objections you wish, but please don't reach a conclusion until you've studied the evidence. that there's a cosmic water yet it's easy to establish we've gone to uh, gone to court using the freedom of information act here's what you get after well this is a justification to a federal court judge by the national security agency a huge organization uh for withholding 156 ufo documents they wouldn't even show any to the judge this is their affidavit to him and that's not the only page like that. You can all blacked out. That's 75 percent blacked out. Here's what I got from the CIA under Freedom of Information about UFOs. Five years to get that very exciting document. Oh yeah, I've read that one. Uh, uh, you're on January the 13th, the Friday, appropriately, on an English talk show, Nick and Ann, a British rock musician named Reg Preston, no relation to Elvis, startled the world by saying that he was aware of 15 reels of 10 minutes each of 16 millimeter footage shot of autopsies and wreckage relating to crash flying saucers in New Mexico. Incredible news. He hadn't seen much of it. And it belonged to a man named Ray Santilli. Last year that some tantalizing pictures were released black and white grainy footage showing an alien autopsy. The debate about whether they're genuine or not is still raging. The footage was first seen in this country last August in a Channel 4 documentary called The Roswell Incident. It told the story of a UFO that crash landed in New Mexico in 1947. This was one of the most important events in UFO history. The program used several minutes of footage which apparently showed an autopsy carried out on aliens recovered from the crash site. The footage was brought to light by a video producer called Ray Santilli. We're talking about roughly 16 minutes of footage of an autopsy of a supposed alien recovered from a crash flying saucer in 1947. Surely one of the most important discoveries ever made by mankind. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary investigation. But the organizers of a UFO conference in Leeds next week say they have new evidence which will prove the footage to be a hoax. 
They're flying in the top Roswell investigator, Stanton T. Friedman. He believes aliens did land at Roswell, but he doesn't believe the autopsy home. I was here in April of 95. I met with Mr. Santilli. I did not get a chance to see the footage. He wouldn't show it to me. He didn't want me to see the footage. He didn't want anybody who was going to be critical. He was looking for people who would go along for the ride, I think. Who would say, yay, verily, this is the greatest thing since the book. Now, on about July 2nd, there was apparently a mid-air collision between two flying saucers in New Mexico. One of them came down almost intact in the plains of San Agustin, a very remote area west of Socorro, New Mexico. The other part, apparently, part of it exploded, showering debris on the Foster Ranch, southeast of Corona, New Mexico, northwest of Roswell. Uh, and a couple miles away, apparently, bodies were found. There was some lightweight, very strong, seemingly structural material which couldn't break through with a sledgehammer. Very thin. And there were some I-beam-like pieces, uh, perhaps three-eighths inch high. Had the weight of balsa wood, nothing to these things. But you couldn't cut them, break them, burn them, and there were strange pastel symbols along the inside of the eye. But as the first to talk to many of the key witnesses, without television cameras, without any public sort of side to this thing, I'm absolutely convinced that bodies were recovered at both locations. We have descriptions of those bodies from people who saw them. We have descriptions of wreckage. And that's a very important database. It's also important to realize that there was very strong intimidation of many of the people who were involved in this case. One of the people who was never said anything about this, wasn't spoken to until I spoke to him in 1989, was Glenn Dennis. He was a mortician at the local funeral home, the Ballard Funeral Home. And uh, when he finally told his story, he had talked to a nurse at the base who had been involved in what was apparently a, an autopsy. Cutting up little bodies that smelled to high heaven. She said, you won't believe what happened. And she said, before I talk to you, before I tell you anything, excuse me, I'm having a throat problem here, but she said, uh, you have to give me a sacred oath that you will not ever mention my name or not. But she said, you can get me in a lot of trouble. So she said, what I'm going to tell you, you don't know where you got this, you know. And she said she never smelled anything so horrible in her life when she got in there. And uh, I said it was, it was the most gruesome, most horrible sight that she'd ever seen in her life. The smell was, it was almost devastating. She said I was never so horrified in my life. She said, no, this is what it is. She said, this is something that that no one's ever seen. So, there is no question from Glenn Dennis's testimony, the testimony of all these other people, of people who saw the bodies out in the plains, that at least two saucers crashed, that wreckage was recovered, that the government grabbed all the goodies, intimidated the people, had bodies, and if there were bodies, there would have been autopsies, and if there were autopsies, there certainly would have been footage, film footage, shot. Friedman was the original investigator at Roswell and has been researching the incident for over 20 years. He thought the autopsy film could be important, but when he finally saw it, he was unimpressed. The main reasons I was disappointed when I saw the footage. One, the body didn't look like any alien I'd ever heard described. I have two separate testimonies as to what the bodies from the Roswell crashes look like. The question is, is the footage genuine? Or, the two other possibilities. People want to say it's either a fraud or it's real. It could be footage shot of a real autopsy of a genetically handicapped for several earthlings, as opposed to just a Hollywood production. We have all three possibilities. And we don't know. So I have made a very massive effort, as have a number of other people, to try to sort this out. One problem is that every time I checked on Mr. Santilli, he wasn't telling the whole truth. As time has gone on, we've looked more carefully at the footage itself. For example, there's one scene where the right hand seemingly is completely separated from the arm. There's a little wedge of space there. This is with six digits now. 
it, and then later it seems to be attached as if so, somebody took a hand and put it on an arm. But one of the witnesses that talked to Glenn Dennis, a nurse at the base hospital, told him. She said, last night I made a diagram. She said, you won't believe this, but she said, I made a diagram. And she said, on these little bodies. And she gave me a, uh, she gave me a diagram of, a, of an arm. Because she said the anatomy from, from the shoulder to here was real short, and this arm was longer here. Which is the reverse of our situation. She said for you. That doesn't match. Practically no ears, nose, mouth. Just a little slit, some holes. And yet they're very clear. Ear folds, whatever you want to call them. And something of a mouth and certainly a nose. The eyes were very deeply uh, set back and set in. And she said the amazing thing about the skulls that, that uh, it wasn't like ours, that it was kind of like a newborn baby. They were kind of flexible that, you know, the doctors couldn't move. But it wasn't, you know, like a hard skull. None of this stuff matches. Now, I cannot say that we have proven that this is a hoax shot by this company at this location on this day. But Mr. Santilli told me. Not only that they had a boxes of material about the cameraman, which proved that he was who he says he was and where he says he was at the time, None of that's been put forth. But he also said that Kodak had dated the film. Well, as it turns out, they hadn't. He'd given them a piece of leader with no image on it. Well, Kodak's requirements were about uh, 50 frames, two seconds worth, roughly, of film full width, because shrinkage is important from determining dates. And with image that's in the autopsy footage. He promised to provide it, promised to provide it, promised to provide the wreckage in the film. Now, if you look carefully, the so-called I-beams, that they call them that, have strange symbols, which spell video, if you look at it in the right angle, which is sort of old Greek letters. It doesn't look anything at all like the replica that's been created by Dr. Jesse Marcel, working with an engineer. He handled pieces of the wreckage. Uh, and he's talking about I beams like this size rather than this size. We've just got lots of questions and no answers. And some of those questions should have an answers. If we are to proceed on the basis that this stuff is legitimate. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary investigation. This footage has not had it. Well, I, I don't know why you're skeptical, skeptical about everything. Well, you asked me, how can you uh, talk about flying saucers if you haven't seen one? I tell them I've been uh, talking about neutrons and gamma rays for 38 years. I've never seen one of those either. Yeah. yeah. But they're yeah. real. Uh, I've never seen Sydney, Australia. Yeah. It's just great, great. You do. <laughs> <laughs> that folks. Is there a government conspiracy to keep the truth from America? That story set the tone. Seven years of massive misrepresentation and cover Dealing with a cosmic Watergate that continues to this day. And one of the many myths about this subject is that the Freedom of Information Act gives you access to anything you want. There can't possibly be a cover-up that would extend that law. A group of us called Citizens Against UFO Secrecy went after the CIA. We want your UFO stuff. They said, we don't have any. Go away. We appealed. They denied. We go to court. Judge says, do a search. They come back to court. They found 239 UFO documents. In the early 1990s, there was a great deal of discussion about Roswell. New books came out. More witnesses came forward. And as a result of this, many people in New Mexico wrote Congressman Stephen Schiff. He's based in Albuquerque. Seeking the truth about Roswell. And he tried, he wrote requests for information from the Secretary of Defense, got no answer. Wrote again, got no answer. Finally, a third time, his request was referred to the Air Force Liaison Office. And they just kind of casually brushed him off by saying, uh, check, we've referred your request to the National Archives. So he, he's getting a runaround. Congressmen aren't accustomed. They ask for a briefing. Normally they get it. So because he sits on the Government Operations Committee of Congress, he was talking to the General Accounting Office, Congress's investigative arm. 
And we're talking about other matters. Is there anything else that we can do for you? And he mentioned, well, he'd sure like to stop this runaround that he was getting from the Air Force. Well, let us look into it. The GAO, it's mandate. Look around all the possible government agencies, find out where their records are located, and see what you can find out about Roswell. So as a massive effort, they sought information from the Air Force, from the CIA, from all kinds of other agencies. Uh, and you have to locate records, not always easy. The Air Force, in its infinite wisdom, decided to take the GAO initial challenge. They did go to the Air Force and said, we need to look at all your records relating to what might have happened there. In 94, September 8, 1994, long before the GAO report was out, it was still working on the report. The Air Force put out its own report, a preemptive strike. What a strange report. And it was only 25 pages long or so by Colonel Richard Weaver, who actually has taught courses in disinformation, which seems very appropriate here. Now, in effect, what they say in this report then was that, well, we did lie back in 1947. It wasn't the radar reflector from a weather balloon. What it really was, was part of a mogul balloon, super secret, highly classified project. As if this was supposed to be some kind of a revelation. Well, those of us who've been involved, I've been working on this since 1978, know very well about Project Mogul. The Air Force, of course, didn't talk to all of the witnesses. They made it sound like they did. Uh, they didn't talk to Major Marcel's son. He's still alive. Medical doctor, pilot, flight surgeon. He handled pieces of the wreckage. They didn't talk to the rancher's son. He was out there on site, found pieces of the wreckage. He handled them. Didn't talk to him. Didn't mention that they didn't talk to him. Didn't talk to the neighbor to whom the rancher had shown pieces before he even talked to the military. I mean, the Air Force has a long history of massive misrepresentation about flying saucers, dating right back to this incident, but many times afterwards and saying false and misleading statements. There is nothing to hide. There is nothing to hide at all. There is nothing to hide. There is nothing to hide at all. The Air Force also, they referred in this 25-page report to all these attachments about Project Mogul, as if this was some big deal somehow. Uh, in several of the attachments, I managed to get hold of copies. They weren't distributing them. I know a television crew that was at the Pentagon wanted to get access to the attachments. They wouldn't let them into the library to do that. There's nothing to hide. There's nothing to hide at all. The Air Force said they had the CIA look at the pictures as if they had suddenly discovered these pictures. I found them in 1979 in Texas. Pictures of General Ramey with wreckage in his office. Him and Colonel DuBose with wreckage in his office. It's phony wreckage. And so we're dealing here with massive misrepresentation. Now, later, it is interesting, the GAO finally put out its report. It was kind of a disappointment. Uh, Congressman Schiff got it uh, July 29th, 1995, uh, put it out that very same day. They listed a number of government agencies from whom they had sought material. They hadn't found anything, basically. That's important for one reason, anyway. They acknowledged, and Congressman Schiff, to his credit, pointed it out that one of the things that was missing were the outgoing messages from the Roswell Army Airfield for a two-year period, including the time of the crash. And nobody knows why that material was destroyed or what was in it. Buried in this GAO report, unfortunately, is clear that they asked the government agencies, CIA, FBI, and so forth, to look in their Freedom of Information files. If there had been anything solid in those, we'd have known that a long time ago. Did the Freedom of Information Act provide the information windfall researcher Stanton Friedman was looking for? Hardly. You can read eight words on this CIA UFO document, and they're not very useful words. Doc reference, info location, stuff like that. Now, these guys have a weird sense of humor. I mean, here's a page, deny in toto, it says. They couldn't even find eight lousy words to release. Uh, one of the things they did, now the Air Force was truly sneaky. They quoted this newspaper article. The next line, which they didn't quote, this is attributed to the rancher, was that I'm sh absolutely sure it was not a weather balloon. 
they leave that out very conveniently. We've had our two years of waiting. The question hasn't been solved, certainly not by the Air Force. The GAO report was inadequate and incomplete. And the American people and the American Congress are still being lied to. Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker, two Mississippi fishermen, reportedly abducted and examined by creatures aboard a UFO in Pascagoula in 1973. Do you think the United States government is keeping something from us about UFOs? There's no doubt in my mind that they, they are. In December 1984, I was first informed that a colleague, two colleagues of mine in California, Jamie Chandray and William Moore, had received in the mail a roll of film on which there were two sets of eight negatives each of a highly classified document which said that there was a crash flying saucer recovered near Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947. It was a briefing for President-elect Eisenhower dated 18 November 1952. Eight pages is all we had. There's a list of a whole bunch of attachments which weren't there. And the eighth page was a supposed memorandum from President Truman dated September 1947, establishing a group called Operation Majestic 12. And the briefing for Eisenhower clearly states it's an intelligence and research and development uh, highly classified activity. It names the members of the Majestic 12 group, which included the first three directors of Central Intelligence, several outstanding scientists. Uh, it was an all-star cast. The question, of course, is were these documents genuine? I spent well over a decade on these documents. Now, all the original members of MJ-12 were dead, the last one dying just three months before we got the documents, which is very significant no matter how you look at it. Document classification is confidential, secret, top secret, and then top secret something, ultra, umbra, magic, whatever. That's a compartmental designation. You can only have access to that information if you've been cleared for that compartment. I've been to 15 archives at one time or another, spending weeks at some of them, the Eisenhower Library, Truman Library, National Archives, Library of Congress, Manuscript Division, etc. I have never yet seen special compartmented information. It's extraordinarily rare. Another document received much more recently is a standard operating manual. What do you do if you recover the wreckage and bodies from crash flying saucers? Also top secret magic. That's almost too good to be true. It's on a roll of film, more than 25 pages. Wow. Several of us, all of whom have worked on highly classified programs, all of whom have technical backgrounds, four of us all together, have been digging into these very deeply. It is our consensus that we can't find any reason for rejecting these documents. We've all raised questions, but the documents pass the test. So I don't think there's any question that there really was a Majestic 12 group. What's interesting about the operating manual is it makes it sound routine, the recovery of wreckage. Remember, the government has the radar. They can spot something coming in. And it gives standard procedures for lying to the public and for how you box up this stuff, wrap it and ship it, and where different kinds of things go to, including bodies. And it stresses that national security here is what's the all-powerful element in determining what we do. If we've got to lie to the public, if we have to give cover stories, an important part of this is to keep the Russians from knowing what we're doing. So these documents are probably the most important ones ever leaked to the American public. I worked under security for 14 years. I can appreciate the need for security about certain things sometimes. But I think it's time that the American people and the rest of the world got told that planet Earth is being visited by extraterrestrial spaceships, that we've known about it since 1947. We have bodies, we have wreckage, we've learned a lot of technology. I think the public can handle it. Don't you? 
Area 51, that mysterious corner of the Nevada test site, is no longer much of a secret. The fact that secretive things go on here is a given, even to the Soviets, who make daily spy flights over the facility to take a peek at what's going on. Area 51 is where Francis Gary Powers and the other U-2 pilots were trained in the 50s, and where the U-2 itself was developed. The SR-71 spy planes that spotted Soviet missiles in Cuba in the early 60s were also developed at 51. 51 is where stealth technology was nurtured, where Star Wars devices are still tested, and where all manner of CIA monkey business has been plotted and refined. And I feel that there's absolutely no sign of a hoax that the photographs are genuine, that the witnesses are telling the truth, and that this presents probably the best, uh, without any doubt, the best photographic evidence in, in 40 years of UFO investigation. If you have any information for Stanton Friedman concerning the events at Roswell, know of the whereabouts of any additional witnesses, or would like free information about UFOs, you may contact Mr. Friedman at area 506-457-0232 or write to him with a self-addressed stamped envelope at the address on the screen. The 105-minute full-length production of Recollections of Roswell contains first-hand accounts of testimony from 27 witnesses connected with the recovery of two crashed flying saucers in New Mexico in July 1947. It's also available through Mr. Friedman's office in Houghton, Maine. If you enjoyed the music on this program, it's from Angels, Aliens, and Archetypes and The Atlantis Factor by Mark Duane and is available on CD or cassette from Backroads Music. Call the number on the screen or the website. Do, do you sort of extend your beliefs in things that most people I don't believe in? I look for evidence. That... No, I look for evidence, but remember, most people do believe in flying saucers, so that doesn't, I don't fit into the box of Mm -hmm. things most people don't believe in. But uh, the problem is, you can't dismiss eyewitness testimony too readily. The reason we can explain most UFO sightings as relatively conventional phenomena, Venus or whatever, mm -hmm. is because people are good observers, they're lousy interpreters. We know it was Venus because they saw it in that direction at that time, at that That's angle above Venus the horizon. Was. You can't say they're lousy only if they describe something that doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. and, and courts of law, after all, eyewitness testimony is extremely important. I have no reason to believe that this film is that of an autopsy of an alien recovered anywhere, no less New Mexico, in 1947. The body, the wreckage, the story, there is no validation whatsoever. When I drove, we went to the nurse club, and I drove back to the barracks there, to the nurse's quarters. And that was the last time I ever saw it. I saw it then. This is the most fantastic story I've ever heard. And every word of it's true, too. That's the fantastic part of it.